So, uh, our guest speaker today is Micah Gravely. He's our District 60, uh, 67 representative, and I think he's going to give us a little uh, insight and updates as to what's going on in the uh, state government. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Micah. Thank you, brother. Well, good afternoon. You know, to start off with it, so you come to lunch meetings and stuff, you, you see folks that you know, and uh, I'm very blessed to live in this community. Uh, it's where I'm raising my children. It's where my family's from. Uh, if any of you are kin to any of the Prices, the Hopkins, the Ellsberries, any, anybody like that up in the uh, High Shows Falls area, that's where my family hails from. My wife's family, fortunately, uh, Heather, the former Heather Butler, hails from the south end of Paulding County. So if you are a, bump, a Butler, a Rump, a Watkins, or whatnot, some way or another, or a Leggett, I may be kin to you in some way. And then I get here to this lunch and uh, see uh, David Lowry, who I was in high school Spanish class with, <laughs> and I would ask for any stories to Nomas. <laughs> And then, little did I know, John Delves, uh, David and I both realized that his son, Jason, went to school with us as well. So it was nice to get a catch up. And then I'll, I hope he doesn't mind this, but many of you probably know Rocky Swan in the back. <clears throat> and, and yes, he was at Osborne High School as well, but he was also in high school with my parents. So it's nice to see Rocky uh, in the back there and make that- uh, Speak louder, he can't hear you. <laughs> Hey, Rocky. <laughs> but it is, it is an honor uh, to serve uh, this community, a community that I, I love, a community that I, I feel like I've invested a tremendous amount of time in, and, and to God be the glory for that, quite frankly, um, through, through any of the public safety endeavors that we've done. And, and thank you to many of the folks in this room uh, who have supported our Public Safety Appreciation Day every year. For the past, this year we held our sixth annual. It's one of the largest public safety events in the state of Georgia. We've raised over $80,000 for the men and women of public safety in Paulding County. And that extends itself to those that maybe work in other departments, offices, or agencies outside of Paulding County. However, they live in Paulding County. And it's such a blessing to know. We don't make a lot of the the support that we do public, uh, that's kept private, but it's so good to know that the business community in Paulding County has been very supportive of that initiative and we get to see uh, the residual effects of our men and women who go out daily, put on a uniform to protect and guard the quality of life that we enjoy here in Paulding County. Uh, uh, my name is Micah Gravely. <clears throat> I live off of Ridge Road, uh, right between uh, Highway 61, almost right down in the middle of Highway 92 and uh, Highway 61. Uh, my wife's family uh, lives literally on either side of me. So it being in the role that I'm in as a public servant, um, it's one thing to keep your constituents happy. It's one thing to keep your father-in-law on this side happy <laughs> and his father on this side of your home happy as well. So uh, I see Lydia Hallmark in the back who is a dear friend of mine and always keeps me, me straight. Ellis Ashton who is very close to our family as well, as, as well as many of you in this room. I want to tell you a little bit about my family. I married Heather. Uh, we met seven years ago, and I'd done some work out in Paulding County from 1998 up until about 2002 when I served with Congressman Bob Barr uh, as one of his in-house directors. And so I'd worked in this area a great deal. Uh, then went away on the foreign mission field um, after that. Well, after that, I'd served with Sonny Purdue. Left the Purdue administration in 2005 and went onto the foreign mission field and served in Ecuador, Egypt, and some various places that I did some humanitarian aid work uh, in Austria as well. And that, and that was a great opportunity for me to get out of a comfort zone, to actually go and to see a way of life that I had never, never been privileged to see before. I'd also got the opportunity to visit Albania and some areas in the Balkan Peninsula. And when you think about the families and what, what is considered to be a great deal of wealth that are considered to be the daily necessities that, that they have to sometimes endure 
or matter of fact, just are, are simply grateful for the, the little things in life, you come back to this country with a, new respe- with a renewed perspective on life, with a renewed thankfulness, a renewed humble attitude, and really it, it hits home how great the United States of America is, how much the Founding Fathers put on the line so that we could live in the greatest country ever imagined. And so I know Dean, uh, he just got back from Cuba, and we were talking about that the other morning over lunch, or the other morning over breakfast, and it, it, that same, same things that you witnessed. And, and it's, it's refreshing, it makes your heart go out to these folks. But it also, I think, is, as I sit here and apply that to the role that I'm in, that helps me govern, and it helps me get a, a very unique understanding on what it means to govern and what it means to be a public servant um, and what it means to really be accountable to all of you in this room. If I'm going to leave this community and go to Atlanta and represent your values, represent the principles of the party I subscribe to and adhere to the Constitution, then you guys need to be, number one, knowledgeable about who I am, knowledgeable about my values, knowledgeable about the principles that I adhere to, what are, what are the, the family perspectives that I have? What are the perspectives on the role of government? And I want you to ask. That's why my cell phone number, I, I've brought cards. And I, and I encourage you to call. My cell phone is on, is on that card for that very reason. Pick it up and call me. Email me. A lot, text me. I prefer a lot of that. Uh, and I want to hear from you. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, my first term, some of the expectations that I had um, some of the things that my eyes were open to, what we were able to get accomplished. And, and what I set out to do when I got down there, a lot of the perspective is, and you hear this a lot in, in your meetings, um, that freshmen are kind of supposed to sit back, be quiet, learn, and listen. And that was an attitude that I had never been used to. Um, it maybe got me in trouble in high school and in college. But I felt like if I'm going to do this with three little girls, If I can't accomplish something, if I can't go down there and work to the benefit of the state and my district, I'd prefer not to be down there. There's a lot of other things. You know, cutting my grass would be one of them. Having the time to spend with family and and my girls. Um, So my perspective going down there was let's get to work immediately. Let's find out where are some some problem areas and let's address them. Uh, I was very fortunate in my first term to be asked by Senator Judson Hill over in Cobb County to co-sponsor an effort in the House. Uh, The SB 176 was the Georgia Medical Identity Fraud Act. Some of you may have heard of this, some of you may not have. Uh, But when you look at identity fraud, all of us over the past couple years, especially as small business owners, have to be mindful about the software that we're using, the transactions that we're receiving, the the income and the outgo of just our daily finances and our businesses. On the personal level, you look at your savings account, your debit card, your credit card. We all know the problems that exist with identity theft, personal identity theft, but none of us really thought about the fact about our medical identity and how different that was um, from our (laughs) personal identity, but really how, how much of the same it was. We had folks and we had tracked a case here in Georgia where a lady in Maryland had had her medical identity compromised and had received insurance bills to the tune of $50,000 in procedures she had not received. And so some investigation went forward. We found out that there were three surgical procedures that had happened to this lady on her medical, based upon her medical records, some insurance group ID numbers, and they get switched around and they get used, and there's a black market uh, society out there trying to access this information. Yet we had nothing in the Georgia Code to prevent this. We had nothing in the Georgia Code really to address this. Then you start further, you dig down a little further, you find out that this is the fastest growing form of identity theft in the state of Georgia. Nine out of ten folks were not aware of this. And we think about our, you know, we get our our credit card statements, we get our bank statements, we'll file them in a folder, a lot of us will file them electronically. But when you get something in the mail from your doctor, a prescription drug statement or just a, a statement from a, a recent doctor visit, were we looking after those just as much? Were we protecting that information? So your group ID insurance, uh, any group ID insurance number, any type of medical savings account, 
And really the, the portion of society that was hit hardest with this was our seniors and our veterans because of the transfer back and forth from hospitals to VAs and uh, clinics and whatnot. So we were able to address that in the code section and really put some teeth in that code section. Number one, define medical identity theft, let the prosecutors and the investigators have a little bit of teeth when they were going after such crimes as this. We were able to pass that bill. I was extremely surprised and honored to be able to carry that bill in the House. It went to the governor's desk, and that was a, the first term of my freshman year. The second year, I was wondering exactly what we needed to do. I spoke to D Director Greg Whitaker uh, over in Douglas County. And this was an issue with my role with public safety that was very, very close to me. Um, it was something that I was unaware of. And when you think about privacy, um, you know, we all say right to privacy. Well, there's really nowhere indicated that we have a right to privacy. In society, we consider things sacred. We deem things sacred. Um, that seems to be eroding every day. But there really is... When you think about a, a right to privacy, where is that defined? Well, a situation happened in uh, 2009. All of us in this room, in some form or fashion, were affected by it. And it was the 500-year the floods that hit Cobb, Douglas, and Paulding County. Very, we're very blessed here in Paulding County that we, we did not lose any of our citizens here. However, in Douglas County, seven families uh, had to go through the horrific ordeal of losing seven loved ones. Seven cit citizens from that community perished during those storms. And so it brought to light uh, a particular instance um, that Director Greg Whitaker with the 911 department over there brought to my attention and said, we've got to do something to change this. And I said, well, exactly what has happened? Well, one of the scenarios or one of the individuals was driving as a young lady she had left her office or left work was driving home wanted to get home before the floods actually got to uh, to made the roads impassable unfortunately she did not do that she careened down into sweetwater creek for 21 minutes she sat on the phone with a 911 dispatcher crying out for help wondering when uh, firefighters rescue paramedics emts were going to reach her and you, you wonder about that conversation. You wonder what goes on, and you, 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 you really gain a newfound perspective and, and really a, a gratitude for 911 dispatchers. At the, 20, at the 22nd minute, uh, this young lady uh, expired in her car. She drowned. The waters in that creek rose to the point to where it fully flooded the car. All of this was captured um, right after a prayer with the dispatcher was recorded, the entire conversation was recorded. Now, you, you think about the individual on the other, sitting in an office on the other side of that line and what has just happened. And then you have to contact, and there were over 14,000 911 calls that came in just into the Douglas County office. Well, two or three days later, one of the major news outlets is speaking with Director Whitaker and said, listen, we'd like to, we're, we're gonna be covering this story this is a disaster zone. It's a declared emergency zone. We'd like to access the phone calls. Listen, the response was, listen, we've gotten 14,000 phone calls. You've got to be specific. And much to the chagrin of Director Whitaker, the response to him was, did you have anybody that died during the call? Well, yes, we did. That's the call we want to access. Why do you need that call? Lo and behold, the response was because it adds to the sensationalism of what we're trying to showcase of what you guys are going through. Make a long story short, uh, Tom Worthen, the county commissioner over there, I, I believe did the right thing and said absolutely not. We're not going to release this call because the families at this time hadn't even heard these calls. Um, <clears throat> then the, the, the solicitor at that time, the DA, actually took a very bold stance and said, you know, you, you're not going to get it. The, the news media said we'll sue for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set this reporter right back up. Make sure it doesn't fall. And under the law of the Open Records Act, they had every right to do so. Um, they then proceeded to try to gather the data. Uh, Director Whitaker uh, put a price tag of $1,400, which was an accurate price tag for that data. The news agency balked at it. But it, it still did not address the question. They didn't, it actually didn't end up purchasing the data. But the question was, is the audio portion of a 911 call 
where somebody's cries an extremist and the capturing of their death, does it serve public good? And should the family have a say-so in whether or not that call is released to the media to be played on the airwaves? And here's the other caveat to that as well. It's not just the media. The law stated that anybody could access it. So a private citizen could call up and say, I'd like that as well. As a matter of fact, I have the $1,400. They obtain the audio, they can create a site, they could go to paulding.com, they could go to Facebook, anywhere, create a site, charge a membership, hey, do you want to listen to some of these calls? You can pay me this fee and then you can access the audio. There's already websites out, out there like that. So here we have another problem. We put this bill in, it went through five different committee hearings, and, but we wanted to make sure that we were not compromising the integrity of a transparent government. So the finished product, I believe, was it, it came down to perfection. The 911 Association dealt with us, the County Commissioners Association, the domestic, uh, Task Force on Domestic Violence actually came to a bill that was narrowly crafted that said the audio portion of a 911 call where the caller and only the caller, because if you, if you remember, the Trayvon Martin case was going on during this time. And so there was the investigation took into to consideration the cries that were heard on that 911 call, and they had to be considered in this investigation. So you didn't want to prohibit investigators or the public from hearing that the call that, that right now was in the middle of an investigation. However, what we did was we narrowed it to where the caller, the individual who makes the 911 call, doesn't matter if the individual beside them, doesn't matter if someone else makes a call, it has to be the caller if they die during the call and only the caller, not after the call, not before the call, during the audio recording, that portion is prohibited from public access with seven provisions, with five provisions. The, uh, the executor of the, the estate, the attorney, the attorney of an accused, if there's, a, if there's a, uh, a murder investigation, the family, the, the attorney for the family or someone who wants to bring a civil action and we will release it to them. If the family gets it and they want to release it to the media, that's their, that's within their discretion. We were able to get that bill passed this year. I was very proud to, to be a co the, the sponsor of that measure. The governor signed both of those bills. We also were able to evaluate, and some of you may know that I'm one of the co-sponsors of the Georgia Fair Tax Act. Um, I know that Bob had talked about that for the last year. He and I are going to be talking about that further, and I'm looking for his wisdom and leadership on that. But when you think about a consumption tax, one of the things we did in Douglasville, once you had Douglasville City, was at an 8% hotel motel tax. The county was at a 5% hotel motel tax. So what we want to do is we wanted to find some type of way to equal. The city's getting more revenue when folks come in for the hydrangea festival or if they're on their way to a little race over in, in Alabama, that Douglasville exit's a great place to stop. Well, the city's benefiting, the county was basically saying, let us benefit at the same, same amount. People are staying, but a, a line basically divides who gets the revenue. So we were able to actually work out, I think, a fantastic idea, because that's a consumption-based tax mentality. You've got folks coming in, they're using your infrastructure, they pay the hotel motel tax. We were able to raise that from five to eight, but the caveat is we exempted the local residents. So Douglas County residents are not paying that tax. Only those coming from outside, maybe through tourism, stopping off at Six Flags, going to Talladega. So the outside folks are using that in a consumption-based mentality. The other bill I want to talk to you about, maybe a little, it's kind of a bill that hasn't got a lot of news coverage, uh, hasn't been in the media a lot. Um, I want to talk about something else right before I talk about this. This session, we talk about taxes. I'm a little concerned because we need to we need to fund transportation. We've been named by three different organs to be the number one state to do business in, and I think that's fantastic. I think that we're going to reap a great deal from the expansion and the deepening of the Savannah Port. I think that the, the influx of, of carriers and traffic and, and cargo coming through is going to affect the entire state. we got to make sure that our infrastructure where, is where it needs to be. However, I don't think we need to raise taxes to meet those demands. 
And especially when you consider the fact that we pay a 4% gasoline tax right now. Well, that fourth penny goes into the general fund of the state. I think we should maybe look at some innovative ways to look at maybe sending that fourth penny into fund transportation. That fourth penny alone is a $200 million tax to the state, or income to the state, revenue generated for the state. Let's look at that before we go down and start looking at raising a tax. And the reason I say that is this. You look at the, the state elections and you look at the national elections, and I think folks, overwhelmingly, it was a tremendous victory for the Republicans. And I say that simply because I think the policies of smaller government, the policies of less taxation, the policies of efficient spending and stopping the wasteful spending resounded across the nation. And so for us to come in and immediately go to work in raising those taxes, I think would be the wrong thing to do. We need to be looking at innovative ways to fund transportation, even if it's looking at how we fund other departments. You've also got to tax the federal government. We sent 14 cents up to the federal government. That was instituted in 1958. They send us down roughly about nine to 10 cents on the dollar back to help fix their roads in our state. The other three to four cents goes to other states where the tax income demand is not as high and they need those, that, that, those monies to, to increase or to help prepare their infrastructure. We should be looking at, and I know Congressman Graves has been working on doing the yeoman's work on helping us here in Georgia get to where we get more of that money back so that we can, uh, we can boast up and prepare and, and really increase our infrastructure here in the state. So there's a lot of different things that we can actually get to here in the state of Georgia without going down there with the mentality, well, let's just go ahead and raise taxes. I, I, don't, I can't support that. Um, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. And I definitely don't think that's the right thing to do without us looking at a variety of different options. If you would like, um, the bill I was going to mention that has, has gotten a little bit of news coverage here lately uh, is the medical cannabis bill. Uh, how many of you maybe have seen this in the news, heard of it? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of things that aren't accurate that maybe some of the news is reported. And when, when people hear medical marijuana, I think there's an immediate subculture. There's an immediate idea of what that is, and it really none of it is true, actually, because when you look at what we're doing here in Georgia, what we tried to do the last section. Uh, last session, and I was a co-sponsor of that bill, HB 885, we're probably further away from what is considered medical marijuana, like these other states have been passing. We're, the, we're almost at the opposite end of that spectrum, because medical marijuana, by definition, is full plant access. That's where you're utilizing the entire plant. You have smoking, you have vaporization, you have pill, you have oil. It's an across the board full plant utilization. Now that's what Colorado has. In addition to met, uh, le the legalization of medicinal purposes, Colorado has also and, and legalized recreational. And you saw in the elections that other states, I think we had four to five other states, that, no, three to four other states to include Alaska, went full recreational as well. In Georgia, that's just not what we're doing. Now we had an earlier law back in the 80s that allowed for the medicinal use of marijuana through smoking to address stage four cancer and glaucoma. Now that was already on the books in the state of Georgia. The problem with that is marijuana is a schedule one narcotic at the federal level. So your universities and any state institutions will lose funding and probably be raided by the DEA if they were to uh, obtain that particular substance. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a situation where how do we address the need? And clearly there is a need in Georgia with a, uh, right now the focus is a specific section of children suffering from intractable seizures caused by epilepsy. How do we do that? When we see that the test results, when we see that the anecdotal evidence in another state is working, and when we see that families from Paulding County are moving out there, and they're saying, my child who was on a feeding tube, who was on six to seven different FDA approved medications, is now talking, his cognitive development 
has increased dramatically and his seizures have been reduced. What do you say to a family like that? And as a state, what do we do to ensure the safety and quality of life of our citizens? Now, what we did last year was we tried to address this by creating a bill and we omitted the smoking form. Now, there's, that's, a, another dif that's another debate. But what we did in Georgia was actually said, we're going to try to replicate what Colorado has done with Charlotte's Web. And that is a strain that is high in CBD, cannabidiol, very low, if any, THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol. And I never thought I would know these, these compounds. And <laughs> Trust me. This has been about eight months of complete, I can't believe this is happening. I never thought I'd support this bill. Um, but when you meet Jimmy and Lisa Wages, and you meet Sydney Wages, and you meet Kim and Kay, uh, Chris Clark and their son Caden, and you see that these, these are not criminals. These are law-abiding citizens. One of them works for our county. The other one is a 25-year sergeant with the Atlanta Police Department. And they're just looking for the same thing any parent would for their child, and that's a medicine. And you ask yourself, what would you do for your child? How far to what length would you go to ensure the safety or the well-being of your, chi your child? That bill obviously did not pass. But it didn't pass because there weren't enough votes. In the House, it passed 174 to 4. Went over to the Senate, it passed unanimously in the Senate. The Senate attached an autism bill, sent it back to the House, the House did not like the autism bill. We took the autism bill off, passed it again, sent it back to the Senate, and 12 o'clock on day 40 came and went, and the bill never got heard. So you ask, where are we now? Well, yesterday I was in Augusta. How much time do I have? Just shut me off when I need to. Keep going. Okay. And we're at here four. Okay. Uh, I'll, wrap it, I'll wrap it up. You know, I'll say this. Yesterday, we ha I got appointed to the, the study committee, um, which is composed of both uh, House and Senate members. And we've been touring the state. We've been listening to families. We've been listening to law enforcement, medical professionals. I mean, advocates pro and against on what we do here in Georgia. Now, to some extent, I'm glad something didn't happen last year for the sole purpose and the only reason because I want us to craft something that's really going to help everybody that needs to be helped. But when you go to Children's Healthcare of Georgia, like where we were yesterday, and you look in the epilepsy center, and you hear and you see that cannabidiol acts as a natural anti-inflammatory and, and reduces seizures. I think it's immoral for us not to look at how, how we can help individuals that are suffering. And if you don't have the money, you're unable to get to Colorado, but those that do are reporting unbelievable results. How do you justify that? The problem is in Georgia is what's it going to look like? How broad is it? And do we stay within a regulatory process that is able to meet the, the desires of law enforcement? the medical industry, and quite frankly, the elected officials. So there are trials going on, an epidiolex trial, which is a synthesized form. In Europe and in, in, in Israel, where all these studies are being done, they've already accepted the trials. They, the research over there is unbelievable. And it's interesting to find out that the American government is funding the Israeli study. Go figure that. And that, they, and that the American government already has a patent on the cannabidiol. So that's, that's amazing stuff that as you dig into this issue, you learn. But in Georgia, we're looking to find something that we can do. It's not going to be recreational. And when I say, when, you, when, when I told you the definition of medical marijuana in Georgia, it's not going to be smoking. It's only going to be in, in an oil form, maybe pill, that's dropped under the, top, the, the tongue of the child. It's probably going to be administered with two neurosurgeons having to sign off on it. It's probably going to be done, hopefully, if we can, and I haven't seen the finished product yet, I'd like to see it distributed through the university system. We have the number one agricultural school in the southeast 
we have the number one medical research facilities in the state of Georgia, there's no reason we couldn't, in a regulatory process or in a regulated environment, be able to study and, and grab the scientific data we need without this thing getting out of control. Now, the beauty and the, the positive to this is that those who want to abuse marijuana or use it recreational find no high or intoxicating effect from the oil. There's actually been testimony that says it doesn't do anything for the, the individual that wants to use recreational marijuana. So if, you're a, if you love Coca-Cola and your body craves Coca-Cola and you want it and you like to drink it as much all the time, open a Coke, leave it out for four days, and then go drink it. It's not going to be the same Coca-Cola. And that's what we're trying to, to educate people on with the difference between what actual high levels of THC marijuana and actual low level CBD oil is. It's an extreme difference. So that's where we are on that. This year in the legislature, I'll wrap up by saying this, um, the gas tax or the way, uh, the way we fund uh, transportation is going to be a, a main issue. Common Core is going to be a main issue. I know that the way we fund QBE is going to be, uh, that there's probably going to be an overhaul there. Um, there is going to be several measures. I know of one already that's going to eliminate the corporate, uh, Georgia's corporate income tax. Uh, that's going to be looked at as well. So it's going to be an interesting session. I think we're going to go a little bit longer than our date of May tw uh, March 20th last year, uh, but we're definitely going to be taking input from all of you, and uh, I would definitely love to come back and give you a kind of an update of where we are on certain things. But if you've got any questions, I know we're about a minute or two, I'd be happy to field five minutes. I'd be happy to field one. Yes, Lydia. Um, there was a bill last year that was not passed that would have prevented illegals who happen to give an amnesty by the president uh, from getting driver's license, which could put them on the mobile mm -hmm. Is that going to be revisited? Uh, I would imagine it's going to be revisited. Um, We're going to have millions more. Well, you look at what happened this in this last session, the last six months of the year, when you had an influx of children coming from all over. How do you deal with that? Uh, now you're dealing with uh, an unknown disease. Still, from a medical standpoint, we're still figuring out with Ebola. Um, what do you? How do you? Do, how do you protect your local community? How do you? What? What measures do you take to ensure the safety of your citizens? So that definitely is going to be looked at. Um, I don't know what manner or form, you know, all bills at the end of the legislative cycle uh, or a term, everything goes to zero. So any bills that were in the hopper, any bills that were being considered the previous legislative session have to go back and start from scratch. So that's probably one that we're going to see again. Yes, sir. Do you know um, how other states tax their gasoline? Are we in line with that? Or are we charging more? You know, Georgia was voted number one in the use of their tax dollars and the, the, the proportion of tax, the proportion of tax income compared to other states. Uh, when it comes to how other states tax gasoline, that's, that's actually what we're going to be looking at and how they, how they use those funds. If, if let's say Florida taxes at six and Alabama taxes at three, where, do, where does that 6% and 3% go? Does it go to fund infrastructure transportation? Uh, is there a split? Does 1% of it go to fund Alabama transportation and other education? That's what we've got to look at. The answer to your question is no, I don't know how other, other states address their transportation or their gas tax. But I'm interested in finding out. Yes, sir. How would they, you control the side operations, if you will, that have cropped up in the other states that have the medical marijuana, but the shops, the individual growing operations. It's a very good question. All that. I mean, that seems to be a lot of the negative side of people because it, it is. It's not just oil they sell. And that's, a, that's why we've been focused specifically on oil. Uh, if we were to pass a, a CBD oil bill, the same rules and regulations for misdemeanor marijuana right now would apply the same traffic stops, the same possession levels, all of that would still be intact. You would have CBD oil, and the folks that did have access to this oil will have a very thorough explanation 
signed off by medical professionals, and maybe law enforcement as well. So the side operations would be treated just like they have prior to any type of legislative measure with CBD oil. Now in Colorado, here's, here's one instance. In Colorado you have, you could have uh, an Old Town Hiram if somebody wants to, to purchase one of the vacant buildings and create a dispensary. That's literally how it is in Colorado. And you can walk in and you can choose high levels of this, low levels of this. There's hundreds if not thousands of strains. Then the consumer can walk in and they can have a, a medical card or they can just be there for recreational purposes up to a certain level. That's a completely different infrastructure than, than we're even considering here in Georgia. But the, one of the gentlemen with CAN Labs, Jason Cranford, testified yesterday. He owns and he participates in solely medicinal cannabis. So he's perfected over the last five years. He can grow a marijuana plant. And he showed pictures of all of it in a very secure location that has next to no THC whatsoever. So it's a, it's a plant that has grown that is high only <coughs> in CBD oil. So if an individual were to get a hold of that, try and smoke it, you ever heard of rabbit tobacco? It, it'd be like smoking something out of your backyard. It's not gonna have any effect. Now he went a step further. Every one of his plants have a scan card on them and they're tagged so that law enforcement can actually stand outside of his facility <coughs> and hit a button, much like you see at the grocery store when they're scanning, and it can account for every tag in that facility. If there is a tag missing, law enforcement has complete authority to go in and request every record. Now, if there's a record missing, if there's a plant missing, he said somebody's getting arrested and going to jail that day. Now, is that, that seems like a pretty secure measure, but we would have to institute something of, of that nature that law enforcement at the local level or local sheriff in Douglas County or wherever could have complete access to go in and be able to account for every single plant, how it was distributed, where it's going, and how it's being grown. That's, and that's only if we have growing uh, here in, in, in Georgia because the bill may not allow for that. It may be that we, we, we import it from another state. Yes, sir. Just one quick question that occurred to me. If, if this is an extract that's non, you know, it doesn't give you any kind of a high or anything, why is, has some drug company not taken this on and it's a, just a regular drug that's under the Food and Drug Administration? That's a great question. Um, and the pharmaceutical industry would lose millions. Because right now, here's, here's the, the plain answer. It's a Schedule One drug. You can't, the research and development has been next to nothing because people lose funding. Doctors could lose their license. You, I mean, you could be, DEA could come in and seize assets. Now, in the other countries, that's what they've been doing. But here, and in the other countries, the pharmaceutical industries have, have seen this is exactly what's going on. But if you look back at the turn of the century in the timber industry and the lobby against the hemp industry, you're going to find a lot of your answers there of how they literally drove the hemp industry out of business. Um, but now what the, what the pharmaceutical companies are doing is they're doing these trials and they've got a synthesized form, which is a different molecular structure on the tail end of the molecule. They added a little, synth a little sensation right there. Well, it's not the pure form of the oil. Now, some of the kids are going to benefit from that, but here's the problem. In Georgia, the classified epilepsy uh, cases that we have are 460,000 <coughs> folks that we have in Georgia with epilepsy. Intractable epilepsy means that you've been on five to six different <coughs> medications and nothing has worked. That means that you're, you're having seizures anywhere from 25, 50 to 100 a day. That's, that, now that's drop syndrome, that's, that's sudden death, all of that. That classification of intractable epilepsy is 92,000 in Georgia. You're talking about a clinical trial that's done by the pharmaceutical companies that is going to include, at best, 50 kids. So what happens to the other 91,950? It's just, and we've already had three die in Georgia. We showed a, a documentary premiere 
at the beginning of the in, in Dallas the other day that was met with great reception. And those of you that came and viewed it got a, a very clear understanding of what we're trying to do. And it dispelled all the myths. When that documentary started being made in March of this year, one of the little girls featured in it died before the, co the conclusion of the documentary. The night of the documentary, we got word that another Georgia child had died from epilepsy. And her sibling had died three months before that. They were in the process of trying to move out to Colorado. Now they've had two children pass from epilepsy. So if, it, you know, it just, to me, the understanding, and this is not something I ever thought I would be a part of. Matter of fact, I was scared to death when I got the phone call. Oh God, please don't bring this on me. But if, if you're elected to do the right thing, then doing the right thing should be based upon not what party you're a member of or you know what lobbying group says this. The, doing the right thing should be based upon what's, what's the right thing to do. And if you can't go down there and do the right thing, then I, as I said earlier, there's a thousand other things I could be doing. And so when you, but when you meet these children and you meet these families, and, and you've got adults that suffer from epilepsy as well. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, with the medical technology that we have in the 21st century, there's no reason why we can't extract an oil and get it to a child where the anecdotal evidence is, is just, it's miraculous almost to see. And, and, to, and that's just dealing with epilepsy. That's not even talking about the other syndromes and diseases that, it's, that people have benefited from. Guns, taxes, transportation, and we legalized all the guns stuff already. So yes, <laughs> we did actually. There was one provision that didn't get passed, but yes, the guns have been been legal. And I was happy about that. I was a co-signer of that bill. Um, HB. I, I guess I'll end with this. One of my bills, HB 826. This was, a, I think, a very good bill, and I, I'm very proud to have the support of our Fulton County law enforcement. In Douglas County was the repeal of zero tolerance. And you had kids that would show up with a pocket knife unintentionally uh, to school or something that could be deemed as a weapon. And they get there and they self-report. And what that means is they maybe took it to a teacher or a principal and said, hey, I didn't, I was on a camping trip or I was deer hunting or I mean, we live in Douglas and Fulton County, that's going to happen. I didn't know I had this, I'd like to turn it in. Well, under state law and zero, zero tolerance, that administrator, had to report it to law enforcement. So at that point, law enforcement gets called, that's a felony. Now a child has a felony, which that prohibits military service, which we had an instance of a child that wanted to go into the Marine Corps afterwards. Wonderful student, never had an academic blemish or behavioral blemish on his record. Brings a knife unintentionally to school, gets a felony, he's not eligible for the Marine Corps. An Eagle Scout. Then you've got a little girl that brings a letter over there. Sheriff Gola said, this is a waste of my time. I know these kids. I know these families. So what we did, long story short, is we repealed that. We actually took it back, and we allowed the local administrator, the superintendents, to be able to make a judgment call. And they very well should have been able to do that. We're, we, were, we were handcuffing them by mandate that we put it back on the local level and said, Listen, if y'all know the child, y'all know the family, you can tell which child, which children are there to, to hurt folks. And that worked out wonderfully. In section C of that bill though, and a lot of people didn't catch this, and I was very surprised that they didn't, it went on to say that any GWC, GWCL permit holders were exempt with their weapons from all school safety zones. Which means that anybody that has a Georgia weapons carry license could have gone inside any type of school, any, anywhere. Now that passed, and nobody knew it. Now I thought, wow, that's interesting. Until, go ahead. What happened to the people, the children that were, that had been charged with a felony, did, did they get expelled? Um, some of them have not. So they're still considered felony? Well, some of them we're working with. Others, that the, the DA, basically in the respective counties, can basically say, I'm not going to prosecute the case. And that's what that's what has to happen. Even though they've already been charged with it, and that's on their record. The ones that those that it's on their record, we're we're trying to help those. And that that actually you got to go through law enforcement, and they've got to go through their own personal attorney on that. 
But what I wanted to do was stop that from continuing to happen. And actually, hopefully we can have some type of retroactive um, fix that would be able to say, okay, we're, this is going to be taken off. We're not going to go forward with it. So you're saying just any time, if I've got a carry permit, I can go to the school and not worry about the cannot carry permit? Under my bill, yes. And that was signed. And two hours later, HB 60 was signed, which prohibited. It actually <laughs> struck. <laughs> it actually <coughs> struck section C of my bill, which was 826. And I had an instance in Beulah over in Douglas County where a father showed up. I think y'all may have read it on the, in the newspaper. The father showed up and said he's going to take his gun to school. Which I don't understand. If you're going to take his school, why is he going to call and tell somebody? I mean, I'm a permit holder. I carry all the time. I, I don't broadcast that to people, though. I don't let people... You know, I'm saying I'm carrying my firearm. Well, some people like to carry it on the outside. So some people do on the outside. Permit. Yep. And we no longer have that in Georgia. It's just an overall, you can carry it concealed, open, whatever, as long as you have the permit. Uh, so that was an instance, but what that situation was easily negated by this right here. Under HB 26, yes, that father would have had right to do that. However, HB 60, which struck that provision in HB 26, was signed by the governor after HB 26. So any legislation, the last legislation signed, if there's any germane sections in that particular bill, it trumps the preceding bill. So it's no longer law. It was for about two hours. <laughs> so in that two hour time frame, if you were, if somebody called and said, the governor signed it, you could walk in and say, I've got my firearm, but at the two hour mark, you needed to walk back out because it was no longer. It was no longer the law of the land. Actually, you can carry bars and carry in churches as well. But as much as a Second Amendment's right proponent that I am, I'm also a property rights proponent as well. And so what we did was we evaluated both. And we said that both, both are important. So the property owner of that bar can say, I don't want firearms in, on my on my place of business. Or the church, be it the deacon board, the pastor can say, as a congregation, we've decided that we're not going to have uh, carry here in the church. Now, if a pastor or a deacon board wants to say, you know what, we don't care. If you want to bring your firearm, bring them. Then that church has a right to do that, or that bar owner has a right to do that. If the bar owner says you can't carry, but the law states that you can, and you carry concealed into the, into the bar, and the bar owner finds out, can they arrest you? It's a $100 fine. $100 fine. If you're asked to leave. Now the law actually cites the property right. So if you if you knew if you went into an establishment and it said we don't permit weapons here, and you go in knowing that, then that individual would be in violation of the law. And if they're asked to leave and they don't, then it's a $100 fine. You could just say, sorry, I didn't see that that sign. Still, walk out of the Yes, without a fight. Without a fight. Okay. Yes. So if you were there and you were drinking your beer or whatever it is you're drinking, your Coca Cola to your water, and you have your firearm, the owner comes up and says, oh, Excuse me, I don't allow firearms in my place. You can say, I, I didn't know that. Let me pay my tab and I'll leave. Then there's no, no incident whatsoever. Yes, sir. Completely off topic, but has there been anything going towards stem cell research? Is there, has there been quite a few things that I've seen? They're quite impressive with stem cell, but uh, it tends to be a real strong topic. It is a strong topic. As a matter of fact, Natalie and I were talking about that prior to the lunch. I'm all for stem cell research. I'm not for embryonic stem cell research. Uh, I'm, I'm pro-life. Uh, make no bones about that. So what I would hate to do is that we're harvesting things um, simply for the stem cell. But when medical research, and, and a lot of this is kind of dovetailing my research into cannabis, when we're not... We can look at skin, we can look at all kind of different aspects of the human body and gain medical technology and, and health and understanding through stem cells and how they replicate, it'd be unprecedented. So I, I very much believe in it. I do have a problem with the embryonic stem cell. And I would like to see more of that in Georgia. If we can actually get some of our research institutes working on that, I'd be very much in favor. Is there any more bills on that or is the federal government still? Not that I know of. Um, there could be some at the federal level, um, but not at the state level, I'd have to check into the Health and Human Services Committee, and I'm, I'm not a member of that community, but I, I, I would check for you, absolutely. <coughs> Is that it? So I can take my bulletproof vest off.
<laughs> and I've got cards as you walk out. Please let me know, and I'll be happy to give them to you. Yes, sir. Well, that's great news for the state of Georgia. Not some good news for the rolling paper industry. <laughs> Which I understand was going to allow you to print political ads on them next year. So. Yes. <laughs>